So I'm Ethan Tapper. I'm the Chittenden County Forester. Um, why would you know what a Vermont County Forester does? For those of you who don't know what a Vermont County Forester does, we are part of Vermont's private lands program. So in Vermont, it's a little bit different the, the way that our lands are owned than here in New Jersey. We have, we're 75% forested, 80% of those lands are owned by private landowners. And so of course, from those private lands, we're all receiving all of these benefits. We're getting clean air and clean water. We're getting wildlife habitat and biodiversity protection. Um, all of these benefits, which are mostly coming from private landowners. And of course, there's no test that you have to pass to become a private landowner. But we all have a real interest in helping those people manage that land well, both to protect uh, the resources on their own land and to protect our collective interests in all those things. So the, the county forester program in Vermont was started in the 1940s. Um, it's been around a long time, and there's a, a county forester for each county. Our job is basically fourfold. So number one, we deal with the equivalent of New Jersey's forest stewardship program, a tax abatement program on forested lands. Number two, we provide stewardship to private landowners, whether you own a couple acres or a couple thousand acres. We just will advise them on how to manage the land responsibly, how to take care of it, go take a walk with them, talk about what's going on in their land. Number three, we manage municipal forests. So I manage about a dozen community forests in the county, covering about 4,500 acres. And number four, we just sort of try to answer this question of how do we improve the quality of forest management and the health of forests in our county with the forests that we have and the people that we have and the threats and the stressors that we're dealing with. And so for each of our 14 counties, the answer to that question looks really different. I've gotten really excited about just communication. So I write these monthly columns in a bunch of community newspapers. I write a quarterly column in this awesome magazine called Northern Woodlands Magazine, have a YouTube channel. I do dozens of public events a year. Um, and a big reason for that is just understanding that one of the big barriers between us and understanding our forests and thus being able to manage our forests responsibly is nuance. And just understanding that as much as we would like to believe that forests and forestry are one thing, that it's many things. And that our understanding of the work that we do is, is built on balances and compromises and us addressing many different things at once. Um, and the way that we do that is through helping people understand the nuances and the complexities of what it means to be a forest steward. So in this presentation, um, we're going to talk just about, it's sort of the presentation that I will often give to people as almost an introductory pre presentation for how we think about forests, but then also getting into some more nuances of forest management, how we can think about the management of forests, and if we have time, a little bit into how we talk about forests and how we think about how we talk about forests. So reimagining forests. So this is something that I often uh, will start a presentation or a walk with is saying that we all know what forests are, right? And we're sure that we know what forests are. But just open yourself up to the possibility that our intuitive understanding with forests might not be exactly right. And that if we need to, if we're really going to take care of forests, especially at this strange moment in time, we need to reimagine what they are and what it means to care for them. So what's a forest? You know, you know one when you see one, right? It's a bunch of trees in a place. There's like some animals in there, maybe running around. Um, a lot of people, it's one of these things where it's like, we all know what it is, but actually, what is it? This is a definition of a natural community. It's from this book called Wetland, Woodland, Wildland. It's a Vermont-focused book on the natural communities of Vermont by Liz Thompson and Eric Sorensen. And it has this definition that I think describes forests and other ecosystems really well. And it's that they are, quote, an interacting assemblage of organisms, their physical environment, and the natural processes that affect them. So it's the trees, but it's also all these other pieces and parts that comprise the system. It is trees and plants and birds and rodents and mosses and lichen and fungi, soils, and even the processes that move and shape those components of the forested ecosystem. So what we know about forest ecology is it's about all these living things. It's about non-living things like soil, although it's debatably also a living thing. And then it's also about even the way that forests change over time. 
And when you really get into the nuances of forest ecology, you find that these changes and even stuff like tree mortality are some of the most exciting parts of how forests work. Um, so when I think of a forest, the, the best analogy that I have for it is it's like a coral reef. The trees are like the coral. They're this living structure around which the communi this community is built. But of course, if we're thinking about a coral reef, we would never just think about the coral itself. We would think about this community that is woven around that living structure, right? And, and if we were to manage that coral reef, the success of our management will be based not on our ability to take care of just the coral, but to take care of that entire community. So that's what we're learning is, as we reimagine forests, we're reimagining them not just as the trees, but as this entire community. And reimagining what forest management is, is not just managing the individual life of each one of those trees, but how do we manage this entire system, including managing how it changes. Biodiversity is sort of like, you know, it's a, it's a really important term. Anybody know, heard of that guy, E.O. Wilson? He's this amazing scientist, pretty famous. Look up E.O. Wilson, Edward O. Wilson. Um, he's written a bunch of different books. He's a myrmecologist, which means he's an ant scientist. And he's just excited about biodiversity. Biodiversity is a contraction of biological diversity. And what biodiversity is, is the variation between species within an ecosystem, the variation between ecosystems across our landscape, and the variation between the genetics within an individual species. So it's the way, it's the diversity of all these different things layered atop one another. And biodiversity is cool, right? We have all these different species, tens of thousands of species that comprise these forested ecosystems, and they are, of course, individually important and intrinsically important. And then we also realize that without that entire community of species, that forest cannot exist. So it's more than just about protecting things that are neat or that are pretty. It's about protection, protecting the function of that system. And it's really hard, <laughs> it's really hard to talk about how forests work and to talk about forest management because almost everybody that I meet, and I think that this is just intuitive, this is just ingrained in us, thinks that that is what a healthy forest looks like. It is evenly spaced trees, uh, nothing growing in the understory. It looks like a park. And if you walk into that forest, most of us, on some level, you're like, yes, this is great. You know, and, and if we, a lot of landowners, as they're managing their forest, they are, uh, on some level or another, managing to that image. A lot of landowners, they're picking up dead wood that's laying on the ground, they're cutting down dead standing trees, they're trying to make their forest look like a park. They're raking up all the sticks and making them into windrows and all this stuff. Um, so one thing I've realized about this is that in, in an uh, understanding of what healthy forests look like is not intuitive to most people, certainly most people that I meet. It's something that we need to develop actively. And we need to, in order to do that, we need to understand that what a healthy forest looks like and what it means to take care of it is unintuitive. And so it will make us feel uncomfortable because we're going against this really intuitive idea of what a healthy forest looks like and what it means to take care of it. It's incredibly important and I think radical to sort of allow yourself to reimagine what a healthy forest looks like and what it means to take care of it, even when that makes us uncomfortable. What do healthy forests really look like? Bam! <laughs> this is maybe like a little, like laying it on a little thick, but, but the, the point is when you start to study forests over time and you start to study them as complete communities, you find that what's really exciting about them is not the individual living trees and their ability to stay alive forever. What's exciting about them is the fact that they're dynamic, the fact that trees are dying, the fact that change is occurring, and all of the different things that that means for a forest community. Oh, the formatting on this one got a little weird. What that says is late successional slash old growth forests. So we do have a template in some cases for what forests would look like if they were unmanaged. And this is what we call so-called old growth forests. I'll talk about in a second. Old growth can be a little bit of a a term that can mean different things, or late successional forest. What a late successional forest is, is basically a forest which has been undisturbed uh, by people for a long period of time. 
How long? It depends on who you ask. It depends on the forest type. Some people would say 150 years. We think that for like the dead wood characteristics of late successional forest to develop, it's going to take more like 300 years plus. Um, if we look at these late successional forests, they do not look like parks. They are multi-generational, so they feature all different sizes and ages of trees. They're combined by many different generations of trees in this multi-layered canopy comprised of that. Uh, they're diverse, but often they're sort of skewing towards these more shade-tolerant tree species. Where I live, that would be species like eastern hemlock and beech and sugar maple. There is dead wood absolutely everywhere. Um, I actually have a funny story about that. In my county, there's this piece of forest called Williams Woods. And Williams Woods, it may have been cut a little bit in the past, but it was never cleared. And so I took this group out to Williams Woods, and they knew we were going to look at this old growth forest. And so we go out, and we're in this stand, which is 80-year-old pine trees and sugar maple poles underneath, and the leaves are changing on the sugar maples, and it's just beautiful. And everybody says, wow, old growth forests are beautiful. And I say, yeah, this was a field 80 years ago. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we're not in the old growth forest yet. And then we sort of like walk along the path, and then we enter the old growth forest. And I hear someone's voice from behind me going, oh, I don't like that. <laughs> it's not into, it's scary, you know, to a lot of people. It's jarring. There are huge dead trees on the ground. There are many different ages of trees. It's hard to get through. There are a lot of big old trees that are sort of alive and sort of dead. It's like all of these different things at once. And it's, it's something that is difficult to appreciate. And if we were to take out, you know, again, mortality and the legacies of mortality, tree mortality, is such an important part of that, that if you were to take out a bunch of wildlife biologists and ecologists into an old growth forest, they wouldn't even be paying attention to the living trees, mostly. They would be right on that dead wood and all of those other different legacy disturbance, talking about the gaps in the canopy, you know, talking about the dead standing trees, all of these other things which are both vital to forest function, vital to wildlife habitat, and are also so underrepresented in the forest that we have today. Whoop. Forests do this amazing thing. I call it the miracle of regeneration, where they basically, what creates that multi-generationality in an old forest over time, and what creates this amazing regeneration, whenever a disturbance, natural or human cause, uh, happens, is this thing that forests do where they just fill space with life, right? You just, by creating an opening in the forest, you know, and this is independent of many of the stressors like deer brows and non-native invasive plants that we're gonna talk about as well. Uh, independent of those stressors, you create an opening in the canopy of the forest and it regenerates. And it's like magic. And actually, you know, by creating openings in the forest of different shapes and sizes, you can manifest tree species diversity because our tree species are adapted to a gradient of different light conditions. So you create openings of a gradient of different sizes. Theoretically, you're getting a gradient of different species. It's also really interesting when you start to understand the way that different species grow and the conditions under which a species can establish. Because then you can look back in your forest and you can realize that every generation of trees in your forest is the legacy of a disturbance. If you have a generation of trees in your forest that all are about 30 years old, you can infer that 30 years ago something happened. It was logging, it was a natural disturbance, it was something that caused a large amount of light to be released to the forest floor and for that regeneration to establish. And if you start to, you can even get a little more granular, which is when you start to think about the species that comprise those different, those different generations of trees, like where I am, white birch and aspen only grow like completely in the open. And so if we see a generation of trees and they're comprised of those species, we can infer that that forest, as you know, beautiful and eternal and unchanging as it may seem, was actually subject to a large-scale natural disturbance in the past. Messy is good. Um, I have sort of already talked about this, but this is a really important concept for people to understand, both on your own woodlots and as you look at, at forest management <clears throat> and also unmanaged forests. Um, is that messiness is a really important part of how forests work. And, and messiness is sort of in quotes because it's messiness as we understand it, right? It's messiness as it sort of contradicts that intuitive idea we have about what a, a, a well-managed or a healthy forest looks like. 
Whenever I'm talking to people about forests, I like to address two misconceptions. Misconception number one, that forests are static and unchanging. Trees live a long time, but they are dynamic. They are defined by change. Misconception number two, that forests are supposed to look nice to us. They are not. They are what they are, independent of whether we think it looks nice. Um, and it's up to us to sort of meet them where they are, not to change them to make them more, more pretty to us. In my opinion, this is the greatest book ever, popular book ever written about forests. It's called The Hidden Forest, Biography of an Ecosystem, not to be confused with The Hidden Life of Trees. Um, the Hidden Forest by John R. Luoma. And he says, quote, ecologists have come to believe that forest ecosystems are, in fact, as much about disturbance as they are about stability. So I like to say it's sort of like learning to see the forest, not just for the trees themselves, but for the spaces between the trees. You know, when you, when you look into a forest and it has just experienced a windstorm or a forest fire or forest management, learning to see that those spaces in the forest are themselves generative, right? They are life which is just waiting to happen. They are a more diverse forest which is about to become on that site right there. And it's really important. It's also very confusing because it takes a really long time. You're not going to get the immediate gratification of, you know, you manage a forest and then instantly it regenerates. You have to wait, which is sort of the most interesting and trying time of being a forest steward in many cases, is waiting for a lot of these things to occur on their own schedule. One thing that's also important to know, and this is again why that term old growth is, is complex, is because I, I talked about what a late successional or old growth forest looks like, and that's specifically an area of forest that hasn't, that's, hasn't been extensively disturbed for a long period of time, let's say more than 300 years general average, although these forests are defined by their irregularity and their variability. But when we look at our landscapes, we see that our landscapes were not just that. That actually, you know, every stage of forest development, every stage of succession is normal and natural and has been around for thousands of years and have species that are adapted to them. Right? So it's not just like every stage of forest development is a means to an end to that climax community. It's that every stage of forest development is valuable. So like we have species that are adapted to early successional forests. We have species that are adapted to everything in between that in, an old growth, in what we call old growth or late successional forest. And so what we really need is landscape level diversity. We need a diversity of forests at different stages of development, different types, spread across our landscape, which is probably what we would have found if we were standing here 300 years ago, would be not just a, a monolith, but many different things um, across our landscape. So I'm more familiar with Vermont's forest history than New Jersey's forest history, but fortunately, it's very similar. Um, you can't talk about forests without talking about history. I'll put my phone up here so I can keep an eye on the time. So what we saw in New England in the 1800s, to, or in the, in the 1800s, largely, was wholesale land clearing. So you can assume that virtually every forest you've ever been in was a pasture at some time in the 1800s, right? So we're replacing these forests which had been relatively undisturbed, although in New Jersey I know there was uh, a fair amount of indigenous burning that was probably occurring around coastal areas. But, um, we, we saw these areas that were, you know, largely these old growth landscapes that were cleared of forests in a very short period of time. In Vermont, it was a single human generation. It was like between 1810 and 1850, 80% of the forests on our landscape were cleared. Um, and as you can imagine, it's actually pretty amazing when you think about it. 1800s, you know, they're doing it with oxes and horses and, you know, saws. Uh, it, it would be a pretty big lift to do that with all the equipment that we have now, wouldn't it? So the narrative is that a lot of that was for pasture, sheep pasture in particular. There was like this in Vermont and other parts of New England, there was this merino sheep craze that was a big deal. There was also, you know, a lot of forest exploitation. So p these early European colonists were uh, using wood for everything. The railroad was a big user of wood. The, the trains were running on wood. And they were also using an incredible amount of wood just in railroad ties. There's this amazing book by Eric Rutko, American Canopy, where he goes through a lot of these different elements of forest history. Um, 
So one of the things he said is by the mid-1800s, railroads were using 7 million cords of wood annually, you know, just as fuel, and that they were using just to replace the railroad ties that were rotting, not to create any new sections of railroad, they were using the equivalent of the timber from 150,000 acres a year. This is pre-advent of the wood stove, so a normal home was burning 40 to 60 cords of wood a year, um, and they, were, they needed wood for all of these fence posts, right, because they were making everything into pasture, and in certain parts of New England, fence posts became a kind of currency by the mid-1800s. As you can imagine, it had a lot of effects on wildlife, so that's the eastern cougar. Um, ex that's the last one that was shot in Vermont in 1881. There was, you know, if you can imagine, you go from a vastly, you know, majority forested landscape to a majority cleared landscape over a relatively short period of time, and you're going to lose all kinds of species. So in Vermont, we lost all the beaver and the turkey and the fisher and the moose, caribou and eastern elk, um, Canada geese, catamount wolves, bear otter, mar uh, marten, passenger pigeons, and others. Some of those were reintroduced. This is beaver reintroduction, which has happened in most of the states in New England. Also, turkeys have been reintroduced. Fisher have been reintroduced. Um, in Vermont, white-tailed deer were reintroduced. I know in Pennsylvania, eastern elk was reintroduced with some elk that they like put on a train from Yellowstone. Um, some of these other species were able to recolonize our landscape. But that legacy remains. So it's really important as we think about what our forests are now that we're understanding like that where we are right now is not a normal place to be. There's this thing that I think about a lot called shifting baseline hypothesis where we assume that whatever we're used to is normal, right? The forests that we have today are not normal. They're normal only in the context of what we're accustomed to, in the context of the millennia of adaptation and change that these forests and the species that comprise them are adapted to, it is completely abnormal. So they are disproportionately younger, so we're talking about mostly forests that are like less than 110 years old. Again, to become an old growth forest, we're talking 300 years plus. Um, forests lacking big trees, lacking structural diversity, different sizes and ages of trees, and also species diversity, and also landscapes that are lacking those kinds of, that landscape level diversity. Um, also lacking things like dead wood, soil carbon, and vastly different forest composition, because most of our forests are a single generation of trees that grew out of a pasture. If you, you know, growing out of a pasture is not a normal thing for a tree here to have been adapted to doing, so like in Vermont, White pine is good at growing in pastures, so it's growing everywhere because every forest was a pasture, but it doesn't, you know, we're not actually seeing that suite of species that are adapted to that site. We're seeing species that are adapted to growing in pastures on that site. Um, so our forests are extremely, extremely altered. At the same time, we're dealing with this, this suite of threats that we refer to as global change. So global change, I find, as a, as a forest steward, is a better way to think about the threats that our forests are facing in the future than climate change. Global change is the composite of all the threats and stressors that our forests face, which includes climate change, and also things like non-native invasive plants, pests, pathogens, animals, uh, pollution, forest loss, conversion, forest fragmentation, deforestation, um, global biodiversity loss, and all these other things, which together if we were just responding to climate change, it would be relatively simple to understand what we need to do. If we're responding to an incredible array of different stressors, it becomes a little bit more complex, right? Because there are balances there. The thing that's good for one thing may be less good for another thing, and so we have to find this sort of dynamic balance. So global change is, I, I think, a really important term for us to be familiar with. We're also dealing with these, these biodiversity threats, so deer, Somewhat overpopulated in Vermont, I know extremely overpopulated in, in parts of New Jersey, certainly. Major threat to biodiversity um, and to our future forests. Uh, major threat to biodiversity really across a lot of North America. Non-native invasive plants, huge deal. Deforestation and development, as was mentioned in the last presentation, like that's the one that really keeps me up at night because we can't do anything unless we can keep our forests as forests. That should say biodiversity crisis. So it's important to understand that we're also in a global constriction of biodiversity, a period of time that has been termed by some the Anthropocene, uh, an era in which human influence is the primary driver that's influencing our ecosystems globally. Um, 
We're in the middle of just this incredibly difficult time. Animal populations have declined more than 50% since 1970. That means 50% of the animals on the planet that there were 50 years ago. Some people would say as much as 68% decline. A million species of animals are threatened with extinction. Um, it's a big deal. And again, remembering that, you know, it's important to take care of those animals, those, all those different species, the millions of species that comprise our ecosystems for their own sake, but then also those, taking care of those species is integrally, integrally related to taking care of our ecosystems. They can't function without them. We can't just grow trees. So with extinctions or with invasives or whatever, we often wonder what would happen if we continue to pull apart pieces and parts of our ecosystems? Um, at what point would they continue to break down and we would just be completely off the map? So the answer is that we're already there. So we are, we are already off the map. We are already in, an in, a, in a totally unknown and uncharted territory for our forests. And so the question then is, is what do we do about it? Which brings up this question, I think about this word a lot, responsibility. So wondering, in, the, in, the, in this changed world, in these alter ecosystems, what do we owe to these ecosystems? What do we owe to each other? What is our responsibility to them? What's our responsibility to each other in the context of all of these different things? Um, we are certainly, as a species, the largest threat to forests and other ecosystems, and we are also probably their only hope. So it's up to us to figure out how we reimagine our relationship with these systems from being an antagonist to being a keystone species. And I would also say, we already have the tools to solve all these problems, we just need to decide to do it. So, reimagining forest management. If we're, if we're gonna manage forests, how are we gonna do it in a way that's gonna be about building a better world? So being, that's about where we are at this moment in time, where our forests are at this unprecedented moment in time, and the threats and challenges that we're facing, which again are completely off the map. Um, and so we need to ask ourselves, can forest management have a positive influence on a world and on each other? Um, I think the answer is yes. So I practice a type of forestry called ecological forestry, which you know, probably most of the people in this room practice a version of. You might just not, not know it yet. Um, ecological forestry is just basically the idea that we're managing forests like they manage themselves. So instead of treating a forest like it's a timber farm or a plantation or something that, you know, we're solely managing like a, like a cornfield, we're looking at the way that natural forests work. We're looking at old growth forests and we're looking at these natural disturbance regimes, the way that forests change over time, and we're trying to manage them within the context of the way that those systems work right? It makes all the sense in the world. You're like dealing with these incredibly intricate and beautiful system that is a forest, and then why wouldn't you want to manage that forest in the way that it works, right? What does that mean? Um, it can mean a lot of different things. Um, in some cases, it can mean doing nothing. But in a lot of cases, what it means is trying to hold all of those different pieces and parts of this moment in time that our forests are at. It means creating these simulation natural disturbances using logging as a tool, right? So we can't make forests, well, I'll talk about that in a second. We can't make forests old growth, but we can make them old growthier. We're realizing that a lot of the attributes that are missing from our forest are the same as those attributes I described that are part of late successional forests. So things like multi-generationality, dead wood, big trees, all of those things, with the exception of big trees, although we can make trees grow, get bigger faster, all of those things are things that we can create using forest management as a tool, and we can create them actually centuries sooner than they will naturally occur. So if you want, if you're interested in old growth forests and the, the benefits of late successional forests, uh, that's great. And I think that there's actually a real consensus in the conservation community that leaving some forests unmanaged to become old growth on their own is a good idea. The problem with that is that it takes centuries and that we need those qualities and those attributes and those habitats now. And the other issue is that because of the incredibly altered nature of our forests, not every forest has the ability to become an old growth forest now, and inaction is not a blanket solution to all of our problems. Um, 
So we're creating spatial heterogeneity. We're creating multigenerationality. We're creating spatial heterogeneity. Heterogeneity. All that means is just we're creating different openings of different sizes, letting them regenerate in different ways. What we call sometimes horizontal structural diversity. We're leaving tons of dead wood on the ground. Sometimes. In these forests of our world, which are so bereft of dead wood, which is just this incredibly, <laughs> incredibly important part of our forests that is often neglected, um, I'm almost as excited to put dead wood on the ground, honestly, as I am about any other part of the project. Here's a fun fact um, <laughs> that, off, that blew my mind when I heard it, which is that a dead tree can have as much as four times the living biomass as a living tree. There is a community to whom that is habitat. And as they're breaking down that dead wood, they're out there turning it into soil. They're also helping that become soil, soil or uh, carbon, which is incorporated into the soil. They're also benefiting soil hydrology and doing a lot of other stuff. So we're putting dead wood on the ground, and we're also creating early successional habitat and other habitats that are underrepresented across our landscape in an effort to number one, protect species of concern because our biodiversity is precious. And we know that a lot of species that are struggling right now, weirdly, are those that are adapted to those early successional forests. Um, and we also want to create that landscape level diversity because we know that it benefits all of our biodiversity. We're managing forests for what we call resilience. So basically, this is the understanding that we are headed into this time period where we expect change to be even more of a disruptive, to be more of a disruptive factor in the way that forests grow. So we have these changing natural disturbance regimes, storms of increasing severity and frequency, wildfires of increasing severity. Um, and we need to recognize that managing our forest for stability is not what we need to do. We need to trade that for an idea of recognizing that uh, stability, that stability is not strength, that resilience is strength, that we need to recognize that forests can't, that they will change and give them the tools to change uh, while retaining all of the natural processes and habitats that they need to to protect their health as a system. But at the same time, it's not like we're giving them the tools to go back to some previous condition. We're recognizing that they're never going to be like the old growth forests that were here 300 years ago. They're going to be changed. And so we need to help our forests also adapt, you know, to manage forests which are adaptive in nature with the tools required to move into the future. How do we manage forests that are resilient and adaptive? Interestingly, the recommendations that we're seeing are many of the same recommendations of managing for late successional forest attributes and also managing for old growth landscapes. So we don't want to put all of our eggs in one basket. We want to manage for a lot of different things at once. We want to manage for within an individual forest, structural diversity, again, that mul multiple generations of trees, species diversity, different species of trees, big old trees, dead wood, seems like it's the answer to everything, right? And then also having that landscape level diversity as well. And then also dealing with biodiversity threats. So a forest cannot change, cannot adapt, cannot respond to the, threats, the stressors that we're facing or anything that we do if it doesn't have the ability to regenerate. So, or to be able to, you know, steward that regeneration into the canopy. So dealing with things like non-native invasive plants, pests and pathogens, and deer overpopulation are really, really important parts of both forest adaptation and forest resilience. I've been getting into this, this, this sort of subset of ecological forestry, which is called managing for old growth characteristics. It's really exciting because, you know, I think that people are captivated by old growth, both because it's like just cool and primeval, and also because it has all of these really interesting qualities, which we know are true, right? It like stores a lot of carbon and like has really unique biodiversity and it's so underrepresented on our landscape. But what's really, really important to understand is that, you know, old growth forests, for the most part, in a function, from a functional perspective, are not cool just because they're old. They are important because of the attributes that they have. Again, I don't know how many times I'm going to say this, multi-generationality, big trees, dead wood, spatial heterogeneity, et cetera, over and over again, which are, again, attributes that we can create. We can't make an old growth forest, but we can make it old growth year again. So there's this really amazing resource from Tony D'Amato and Paul Cananzaro called Managing for Late Successional Attributes. So it's actually asking this question, like, 
you know, saying, okay, well, we love old forests. We know that we want to protect all of our existing old forests. We know that we want to leave some forests unmanaged to become old forests. But also, how do we actively address this moment that we're in by managing forests to be like old forests on a compressed time scale so that we can have those attributes in the short term? Um, there's this idea of intact forests. Have any of you heard of this term, an intact forest? Um, it's defined by some to be forests which are free from human intervention, right? So an intact forest, it doesn't matter what qualities it has, it doesn't matter what it looks like, it's just a forest that is, humans are not managing. And I sort of, you know, maybe this is out of context if you haven't heard this term before, but I sort of chafe at this idea because, again, I think it is so important to understand that what makes a forest intact is the qualities that it has, right? It's not whether we're creating these attributes or whether these attributes are cre being created by a natural disturbance is less important to me than the fact that we have habitat for a wide range of our biodiversity, that we have forests that are adaptive and resilient, that we're giving uh, our wildlife the tools to adapt to this moment, and that we're protecting this community writ large. Um, that's what will make this forest intact. It doesn't matter if it's we're doing it or if it's happening naturally. It's that those attributes are there. Five minutes. Two more slides. Um, and I think about this when I, talk to, when I talk to landowners about that. It's actually sort of an exciting moment that we're in right now, right? Because we hear of these accounts of forests that existed here just a few hundred years ago. And they were, we hear these accounts of just game and fish and life beyond imagining, right? Um, we have the opportunity, if we choose to do so, to help rediscover a portion of that, right? So we have an opportunity to rediscover a capacity for life in our forests, again, by managing them and by helping them rediscover those attributes that have been lost um, and protecting all of these different species in all these different ways. We have an opportunity to do that and to sort of rediscover this capacity of life which we've never seen, right? Which is totally beyond our wildest imagination and again, we just totally, we need to choose to do so, and we need to be willing to make the uncomfortable choices necessary to get us there. We're not going to do it by doing nothing. So when I talk to people, look at that. When I talk to people about forests and about forest management, and I help them understand that the way that I see forest management is really as an act of compassion. Um, what does it mean to love a forest in this moment in time? How do we address this moment that we're in and how do we respond and we talk about what we're doing and I do these demonstration forest management projects and then we get out to the log landing and we look at that wood pile and it's such an interesting and catalyzing moment and the reason for that is because our challenge as, as forest stewards and as humans at this moment in time is not just to make our forests healthier right it's to find a way to do that while also living here and wouldn't it be amazing if we didn't need to consume anything to exist. And the fact is that we do, right? And the fact is that the real question is not like, how do we make our forests healthier? It's how do we develop a relationship with this ecosystem that is positive and regenerative while we're also getting the things that we need to survive? Wood is a local renewable resource, and we know that, it ha that local renewable resources have global biodiversity and human rights benefits. We know that when we say not in my backyard to resource consumption, that we're just displacing the impacts of our lives on people who don't have the privilege to say not in my backyard. And that in places where we don't have the ability to have any say over how those resources are produced. We know that if we're saying no wood here, it just means more wood somewhere else, which will often be in these forests that are managed in this industrial way that may be way worse from our, from our perspective. And so this, in my mind, this is not a contradiction of what we're doing. This is like the most radical part of it. We're doing all of these things within the context of commercial management while we're also producing local renewable resources as a byproduct, and that's beautiful. I got to stop, but I'm going to be on a couple more panels, maybe get to talk about a few more other things, but I'll just leave you with this idea. What does it mean to love a forest? at this moment in time. It's really strange. It's really unintuitive 
at times, and it requires us to make these big compromises to change the way that we think about forests and the way that we think about managing forests. Um, but that's what makes it so important, and that's what makes it so powerful. Thanks.